Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. It's uh, another edition of Live with Lenny. Must be Thursday, 5 o'clock, right? Um, so glad you could join us. Um, we are going to be talking about, uh, Lenny's going to be giving us some tips for bottom fishing. Um, sounds like some other areas of my life, at least early, in the early days. Um, but I, uh, I was just talking to Lenny a little bit earlier, and um, he was telling me that uh, the kind of fishing that I wanted to be doing. He's like, you want to be doing some bottom fishing right now. Um, and so I'm actually going to be making sure I pay attention so that uh, I can catch some stuff this weekend. Um, hey, uh, so just before we get started, of course, um, I've got to uh, do some business here. First off, Curtis Stokes Associates uh, is our sponsor for this episode. Uh, without them, we can't do this. And when you support them, you support us. So really appreciate Curtis Stokes. Uh, uh, advertising with us. Um, if you're looking for a fishing boat, uh, they're probably you know the best place to start out with. Um, they got a, a nice inventory of good quality used boats. Um, so check them out when you have a chance. Also tonight, we have a special uh, giveaway um, sponsored by Boat Life. Now, if you don't recognize uh, Boat Life, they're one of the oldest brands in the boating biz as far as products are concerned. And they, they specialize in a lot of different uh, products, but uh, in mostly in the in cleaners, and they're making a heck of a lot of sanitizer right now for everybody. Um, but what we're going to do tonight is if we use your question uh, with Lenny, we're going to put your name into a little hat here, and at the end, we're going to uh, draw names, draw somebody out, and if we pick yours, you're going to win a, uh, a bottle here of the fiberglass powder cleaner and stain remover. Um, it's a pretty cool product. Um, works really well. Uh, it's biodegradable. It's great on non-skid surfaces, um, and uh, it washes off uh, with fresh or salt water. So brackish water, you can just use it. That's great. So anyhow, check them out, Boat Life. Um, and like I said, at the end of the episode, we'll draw a name, and uh, we, that will be you. So ask some questions. Um, and with that, without further ado, um, I'm going to bring up Angler in Chief. Two, one, boom. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Good, man. How are you? Excellent. Ready to talk fishing? I'm ready. How about you? I'm so ready. All right. All right. So. No, no, no small talk. We're just going right to it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> there's stuff to talk about other than fishing? I don't know. What's he talking about? I don't know. So we're going to start off tonight with a little demo because – it drives me nuts when uh, I get on someone else's boat and they pull out bottom rigs and I see this done the wrong way. Number one, tip number one, buy your bottom rigs in bulk. Don't go to the tackle shop and buy two. Buy them like 10 at a time. Get them all prepped ahead of time so you are ready to catch fish with them when you hit the water. And we're going to take a quick look at how to prep them because if it's not done the right way, it can end up being a big mess. And they're going to fight me. They're not going to come apart easy here. Come on now. Come on now. Clearly, I should have prepared ahead and taken these apart before we got started. But you're just going to have to deal with me fumbling through as these guys do not come apart. Huh. How about that? Who to thunk it? Um, hmm. All right, no need for you to watch me uh, fumble. Chris, go ahead and pull up the first slide, and then we'll go to our demo. This is an important one here. What you see there is bloodworms. I know, I know. You're looking at like 30 bucks worth of bloodworms in a pile there, right? They are stupid expensive. But I got to tell you, people, when you're bottom fishing, there is nothing that doesn't like to eat a bloodworm. I mean, everything eats a bloodworm. So... My suggestion is, when you're going bottom fishing, consider getting some bloodworms. Um, now, I finally got this partially disassembled. Let me just get this little clip off of here. Chris, go ahead to the next slide while I fumble some more. I like the next slide because this is much cheaper and less expensive than the bloodworm. Uh, it's kind of hard to see on there. Can you make it big, Chris? What we got on the hooks on there are fish bites. See those little red dots? Those are fish bites. Fish bites bloodworms work quite well as long as the water is fairly warm. When you have 60-degree uh, water, 
it's generally it, it just doesn't seem to dissipate into the water as well i don't know what the deal is but it doesn't work quite as well now that said i always have a big bag of these in the console on my boat in the uh in the leaning post in my tackle storage spot uh they're always there 24 7 and uh whenever the water temperature is you know 70 degrees or more those are the bait that i'll reach for and again, not only are they less expensive than bloodworms, they're a whole heck of a lot less messy. And they work quite well. All right, now, Chris, make me big again so I can do my little demo here. I finally got my bottom rig apart. And I'm going to pull out a hook here. I like the eagle claws that come pre-leadered for this purpose. And what you're going to see here is uh, a pretty big hook, right? That is a, what do we got here? Two aught. And I'll make bottom rigs like this for like, you know, sea bass, small weak fish, flounder, you know, medium sized fish, not the little spot, but a little bigger. That's the hook size. But regardless of what you're fishing for, this is critical. Here's your arm on your bottom rig, right? It's got a little space at the bottom there. When you rig this, don't just go through the end, okay? Because what happens is you end up with a leader that long. And then your bottom and your top hooks, they're going to tangle. It will happen. It's like a guarantee. And I know most of the people watching this right now are like, yeah, you know, it happens all the time. Here's how you solve that. Take your hook and go through that little space in the leg first. Then take your hook and go through the little loop in the end of the arm. Okay. Now I'm going to grab the loop at the end of the leader. I'm going to put the hook through it. And I'm going to cinch it down. And what's going to happen is I'm going to have a leader about half the length. Okay. This will not tangle. The top and the bottom will not tangle. You've got that leader a little bit shorter there. And that is the way to do a bottom ring. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to get 10 bottom rings at least. I mean, I think I buy them in like 50 packs usually. You're going to do a bunch with number six hooks for your spot, right? Your, your little bait fish. You're going to do a bunch with like number twos for, for some medium sized fish and do a bunch with your one aughts or your two aughts for when some larger fish are around. Okay. All right, Chris, take us on to the next slide there. The one after the, uh, the spot on the fish bites and uh, no, this fish wasn't caught bottom fishing. This fish was caught on the spot. And you can see it's the same people. That's that's my brother and one of my boys. This day, you know, we went out there, we caught our spot, live line the spot, caught the rockfish. Obviously, a lot of people like doing that, very common tactic on the bay these days, particularly during the summer months, highly effective. So uh, there's a great reason to go bottom fishing right there is just to get your spot. Now, I want to say one other thing about that, though. Um, I actually got an email just today from someone who caught a spot this week all the way up north at Turkey Point. I'm not talking Turkey Point on the South River. I'm talking Turkey Point way up at the top of the bay. I was kind of shocked that that some have already made it up there, but evidently they have. And he asked me, should I live line with this? Well, you know, my answer would normally be, yeah, sure. But I have noticed, I have noticed, uh, if you kind of try and rush things with live lining spot and do it too early, the rockfish just aren't focused on them yet. They're still focused on bunker. They're chasing other stuff. And sometimes they just kind of ignore the spot. So if you go out and you don't catch your spot in a couple hours and you got to really hunt and peck for them and they're really hard to find, you might want to think about trying a different tactic because I, I have absolutely seen it before where I've spent like all day catching spot because there's just very few around. Uh, this I, I did this two or three years ago, first week of June. There just were not many spot around at all. Finally got like 20 spot, went live lining, and we caught a few fish, but mostly the rockfish ignored the spot. They just weren't into it. We actually caught more fish on jigs. So think about that. All right, take me on to the next one, Chris. Here's another common fish you're going to get bottom fishing. That's your white perch, right? And I wanted to put this slide in here because if, if you look closely there, you can see we got the beads and the spinner on the end of the leader. The old beads and spinners, do they really make a difference? It's another question that comes up all the time. I'll tell you what. I don't know. Maybe they do sometimes. Maybe they don't a whole lot. They certainly don't make enough of a difference that I'm a big believer in always making sure you got the beads and the spinners on the line. 
the one exception I'll give to that is with your flute killer rigs, which basically isn't, you know, another form of bottom fishing. Um, the, the, they all have either the beads and spinners or the spinning glow, the little propeller guys on the end there. And that seems to make a difference. It really does in that particular case. Other than that, I don't know, you know, I don't think it hurt anything. Um, I have seen a few situations where the, the, the fish have been so dang thick that you actually don't have to bait the little spinner hooks. Uh, that's rare, obviously. Um, so maybe you want to keep a pack on board for the, the, you know, once in a blue moon when that happens. But generally speaking, it's not something I pay a heck of a lot of mind to. All right, Chris, take us on to the next slide here. This perfectly illustrates what I personally love about bottom fishing. You can see in the background that is Thomas Point Lighthouse. And yes, that little boy is holding a black sea bass in his hand. I think we caught five or six that day, right around the rocks at Thomas Point. And that wasn't our intent. Our intent was to throw some bottom rigs and catch some little fish just to keep the kids happy, you know. But, uh, but you just never know what's going to eat a chunk of bait sitting on the bottom, especially when it's a tempting bait like a bloodworm. Um, now, I do want to say before we go to the next slide um, that, you know, bloodworms are expensive. It's not always going to be the best bait. A few of my other favorites I wanted to mention were peeler crab and soft crab. Just about everything loves peeler crab and soft crab. And if you're fishing in an area where there's some larger fish, say some puppy drummer around, Chunk of peeler crab on the line is going to be hard to beat. That's a really good bait. There are weak fish around. Soft crab, they absolutely love it. Squid is one. I've never understood this. I got no scientific explanation for this whatsoever. Th there's not a squid in the Chesapeake Bay, right? And yet, when it comes to catching croaker, uh, they eat squid. And you can put squid anywhere, and there's croaker there, they'll eat it. So I, I don't get it. But, you know, another bait you want to keep in mind. And then, of course, finally, we should mention clam. Clam is often a good bait when you're fishing for sea bass in the ocean. Um, so just, you know, some different baits you always want to maybe consider having on hand. All right, Chris, slide us over to the next one here. Oh, we got the big fat horse croaker. I know what you people are thinking. Where can I get me some of them? Uh, yes, that is an old picture. Yeah, that was taken years ago. They've been hard to find. There have been some caught already, but it hasn't been been big horses like this. There have been a few keepers down towards Point Lookout in Virginia Wooders. Uh, I get asked all the time, what happened to the croaker? When are they going to come back? Did the netters kill them all? The answer is, I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I don't think anybody knows. I think anybody that tells you they know exactly why the croaker aren't around anymore uh, probably is just shooting off their mouth because the fact of the matter is we've done no scientific study on them. This is a fishery that is not monitored very well by the powers that be. And the fact of the matter is they're cyclical fish. I can clearly remember when I was a little kid, we would go croaker fishing and we would catch croaker. And then I clearly remember a long time frame. I guess it would have been the 80s um, when you just didn't see croaker at all. Um, and that lasted into the 90s. And then at some point we started seeing these big croaker. They just kind of came back. Uh, well, and then, you know, early 2000s they left again uh some fish are cyclical and that may be what's going on with this fish i don't know weak fish are the same way we hear a lot of chatter about weak fish how come we don't catch weak fish anymore um in my lifetime i've seen them come and go at least at least three different times and it seems like we're due to get them back it's about time they they reappear and i sure hope they do uh, there were some weak fish caught last year way down the bay. There were a few up the bay in Maryland waters, but it was really more of a Virginia thing. You know, hopefully we'll see them again. I don't know. All right, Chris, move us on to the next slide. Here's another one. And I'm going to ask you people right now. Oh, I, I forgot to say, I should have said at the start. If you got questions, plug them in to the comments. Uh, we will answer them. And, hey, you might win a boat life product, right? So why the heck not? Uh, C. Robbins. So here's my question to you. I want to know from you people, has anybody ever tried eating a C. Robin? I have thrown back a gazillion C. Robins in my lifetime, never even crossed my mind to try and eat one. And someone told me last year, hey, they actually taste pretty good. But for all I know, that could be a total rumor. So please, if you've eaten them, pop it in the, in the, in the comments right now. I want to know. What do they like? All right. Take me to the next slide, Chris. Because here's another wacky one that 
nobody eats these fish, right? These are puffers. Very few, I should say very few people eat them. I love them. These are actually really good eating when you get them big enough. Now, this picture of this puffer, and, and by the way, you'll get the puffers on pretty much all these baits, particularly bloodworms, all over the place. I've caught them as far north as in the bridge. Um, last year, the chop tank was utterly full of them. Uh, not many real big ones, but lots of them. And you would get some big ones if you picked through them. This fish was caught in the chop tank. And I took him home and I put him in my fish tank. And I actually took this picture in the fish tank. The really fascinating thing, anybody who's got a big fish tank at home that has bay water in it, uh, the next time you catch a puffer, take it home and put it in the tank. These fish are fascinating. Not just the whole blow up thing, but also the fact that they, they are probably the most aggressive species I've ever seen short of a mako shark. I mean, they're right up there with bluefish. It's fascinating. You put your finger against the side of that fish tank, he would sit there and try and eat through the glass. He would just attack, 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 attack. So very interesting. But again, if you catch a puffer and he's a big one, they're good eating. All right, take me to the next slide. Hey, Lenny, I'm going to put this question up. Um, hit, hit me. There we go. Your opinion on percentage from blood run to fish bites. So, Mark, I say it depends on the conditions and on the water. Uh, if it's 68 degree water, I think you're going to go two to one bloodworms. If it's 75 degree water, I'm not sure you're going to be able to tell any kind of difference. I'm really not. Um, and when I tested this, I started testing this years ago. The fish bites bloodworms have been around for a long time. Uh, but I started testing this surf fishing um, because surf fishing, I consider bloodworm to be a critical bait. It, you get your kingfish on it. You get your spot on it. You get your croaker on it, your small fish. And a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm running two rods, a little rod with bloodworms and a bottom rig, and a big rod with a big doodle bug rig, and I'm hailing way out there trying to catch, you know, your bigger fish, your bluefish, your rockfish. And what I really like to do, I like to catch a little spot and uh, cut them up or fish them whole on the, on the big fish rig and throw them out there. So I'm always running that bloodworm rod. And what I found was, at least in the surf, in the middle of the summer when the water temperature's up, I could not tell a difference. So in warm water, I don't think you can tell the difference. Once you get below that 70 degree mark, then it's a different story. Then you really need the blood worm. All right. Oh, question from Dan. Why do people have blood worms at high ground? Oh, blood, uh, now my phone goes off. I forgot to shut it off. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, fish blood worms and night crawlers side by side in the Chesapeake Bay, and these fish we're talking about, blood worms will outfish the night crawlers five to one five to one. You will have days when the night crawlers will catch absolutely nothing and the bloodworms will catch tons and tons of fish. There's really no comparison. Now there are some exceptions there. White perch sometimes really like the uh, the night crawlers, uh, particularly in the early spring when they're in the salt ponds. Sometimes the night crawlers do great, but as a general rule of thumb, the bloodworms kick their butt. And yeah, they're expensive, but that's why I started out tonight by saying, spend them, it's painful. Spend the money on the bloodworms. It's, it makes a difference. All right, Chris, we got another question. We go on to the next slide. Let's go to another question, and then we'll go. Okay. How long will spot keep in my bucket with an aerator? Airstone. So, well, that depends on the size of the bucket, first off. But here's a rule of thumb that I go by, okay? When you have a contained unit, like a five-gallon bucket, that you're aerating, you can keep – a, a fish per gallon of water alive the better part of the day. If it's hot out, grab some ice and throw it in there every couple hours to keep the water cool. That'll make a big difference. Um, if you're going fishing and you want to try and keep 10 in the bucket, you might get away with it. If you use them quickly for bait, you're pulling out and using them. Uh, you can probably get away with it in the morning when it's cool out, but you're not going to be able to get away with that all day. Okay. Um, I actually have, uh, uh, a, I guess it's a, it's about a 10 gallon cooler that I cut the top in and I have a little aerator I hang on the side. Uh, I'll use that to transport spot with, and I find that that is no problem up to 10 spot. I can kind of cram 15 in there and get away with it for short periods of time. I've done as many as 20 and they start to go belly up. So I, I you know, that one fish per gallon is a, is a safe rule. And you can get away with pushing it, but you're going to start to see die off at some point. And if you go to 10 fish in a five gallon bucket, any extended period of time, you're going to see die off. 
All right. Um, All right. Hit, hit me with that slide. I'm done. Oh, what? I'm dying for the next slide. <laughs> Did sorry. you target or catch any flounder in the bay in 2019? Yeah, Dennis. Uh, every year I make it a point to try and target them um, and figure out if they're coming back, if they've come back. Uh, last year, I did not get any in Eastern Bay. I did try two days I dedicated towards them. I did not get any. I did get them in the chop tank. Uh, I also got them in the hook on the south side of Poplar Island. However, none were even close to keepers. I think the biggest was 13 inches. These were mostly like 11, 12 inch fish. They weren't real big. Now, I got high hopes for this year, and I'm going to tell you why. We've already got reports of keeper flounder, multiple keeper flounder in a day, being caught by people in both the Pocomoke and the Tangier Sounds. They started, those reports started coming in two weeks ago. That's early. That's good. It's a really good sign. So it, it absolutely could happen coming up the bay farther this year. Uh, but right now, already, Tangier, Pocomoke, they're catching them. I've heard of one, uh, one on the western side off Point Lookout. And I don't think any people are really targeting them. So it's a really good sign. Keep our fingers crossed. All right. I'll let you go to the next uh, slide. All right. I'm dying for this one here because this one goes back. This was supposed to come in quick succession after the puffer fish and the oh, sea <laughs> robin. No, no, it's cool. I love being interrupted by questions. I do. I love it. But just so everybody watching knows that there's a tie in here because here is the dreaded toadfish. If you've ever gone bottom fishing in the Chesapeake Bay, you have caught this guy. And somebody told me a couple of years back, you know what? They're actually pretty good eating. And I said, wow, what? I've thrown back 10 million toadfish through the years. I never even thought about trying to eat one. Who wants to eat something that looks like that? But hey, I'm going to try it. I mean, monkfish look kind of like that. They taste good, right? So last year, I was in the chop tank at the reef ball reef, the CCA reef ball reef. I caught some of the biggest slimiest toadfish I've ever seen in my life. Every one of them had to be five plus pounds. And I thought, I'm putting them in the cooler. I'm taking them home. I'm putting this to the test. Well, people, I have news for you. If anybody ever tells you the toadfish are actually pretty good to eat, just slap them, okay? Just do me a favor and slap them. Um, a, they're all head. They have less yield than a catfish, like half the yield of a catfish. You take a five pound toadfish, I'm telling you right now, four pounds is head and a half a pound is gut. You're left with like a couple little fish tidbits. And then you got to struggle through trying to cut them with all that slime that they have. It's not easy. And then you finally get this little nugget of meat and you tell yourself, maybe it'll taste really good and this will have been a worthwhile endeavor. And it really tastes pretty good. It's just, ugh. Uh, uh, don't try and eat the toadfish. Okay, that's my two cents on the toadfish. All right, Chris, we can field questions or we can go to the where to slides now. Either way, you're calling. I don't know how many questions we got. All right, let's uh, let's go to some questions because I uh, I got a couple that I thought we should get to. Okay, does tide matter when bottom fishing? Yeah, you bet it does. Does it matter less when you're bottom fishing than say when you're jigging for rockfish or when you're actually live lining? itself yeah it does uh and that's one of the things i like about bottom fishing usually the shutdown period on the on the off periods of the tide is much much less significant you know when you're fishing for rockfish just as a for example you know you've got an hour and a half to two and a half hour slice of the tide that's going to be good and then it's really going to drop off in all likelihood not always but you know in all likelihood it's going to drop off when you're bottom fishing, it's kind of the reverse. If, if you have a six hour, you know, the six hour tidal cycle, if you have an hour that's off, that's a lot, you know, maybe an hour and a half, it's a lot. Um, most of the time, when you put the bait on the bottom in front of the kinds of fish we're talking about, they're gonna eat. Will it, will it pick up during the, the good part of the tide? Well, sure, but it's not nearly as significant. What else you got for me, Chris? There you go. What structures the right spot. Okay, so we're going to talk about it in a minute. Just keep blasting. That that's the next segment. Oh, okay. All so right. keep blasting questions or take us to the next slide, whichever. Um. Uh, well, is this related? I don't know. It's depth, but we're just talking about spots. Same thing. Keep on going. All right. We're right. about to talk about it. What's your setup for live lining, Lenny? Setup for live lining. So okay, I'm gonna. 
I'm going to, I'm going to uh, caveat this discussion by saying, I don't think I'm going to live line this year. I, at a, in mid August last year, I stopped, I, I swore it off uh, using circle hooks, the whole bit. I pulled up another 18 inch fish that just had blood pouring out of it. I said, that's it. I'm done. Um, but what I'll use is a uh, 17 pound bait runner style rear reel and rod uh, mono line going through an egg sinker, vary the size of the egg sinkers depending on where the fish are and how many lines I'm running. That's tied off to a ball bearing swivel. That gets clipped to a three to four foot section of 30 pound fluoro, which I tie a loop in the end, uh, clip one of the loop, and then a eight aught or bigger circle hook, uh, either going through the fish in the jaw or behind the dorsal, depending on the current situation. Might go uh, in front of the dorsal if the fish needs to swim into a strong current. I don't like the behind the dorsal hook when, the, when I'm in a strong current because then the fish ends up being pulled backwards through the current. It doesn't look natural. Um, you know, I mean, do the circle hooks help? Yeah, they seem to help versus the J hooks, certainly versus treble hooks. But I still, I was gut hooking a lot of rockfish last year and I just kind of had it. They were undersized fish, you know, 17, 18 inch rockfish will eat a spot that big without hesitation. And it was just happening too much for my tastes. So I'm not even sure I'm going to do it, but that's my setup. That's my setup. All right. One last question from John before we move on to the locations. So I hate to make predictions because, man, when you make predictions, you always turn out to be wrong. But, 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 but so far in the last work week, I've heard of three bluefish between 22 and 35 inches being caught in the middle bay. So I'm thinking it might look pretty good. Might look better than it has in the last few years. Um, uh, you know, my fingers are crossed. Oh, we got our slide here. All right, so let's talk location a little bit here. And this is standard spot and perch. You're usually going to get your spot and your perch a, a mix uh, in the middle bay. Um, and the areas I've got pointing to are oyster bar uh, areas where you got a rise that comes up. It's going to be the 10 to 20 foot zone. Quite often that 14 foot zone is like your hot spot. If you have an area where you have an oyster bar that's extended through 14, 15, 18 feet of water, and you can just drift over it, that's great. Areas like this, where you've got a hump rising up and you want to be on the edge, you're probably going to want to anchor. Um, sometimes you get away with drifting it if there's not a whole lot of wind or current. But that's the depth range. That's the zone. It really won't change much throughout the course of, course of the summer most years. Sometimes it does. Sometimes eight foot gets to be really hot. Uh, but that's, you know, that's kind of your general zone, your general area. Uh, all right, go on to the next one, Chris. And here what we're going to look at. we got to make it big. We can't see it. Can we make it bigger? Block me up. Make it big. Make it big. Okay. So what you're looking at here is an artificial reef in the Chop Tank River. It's a CCA reef ball reef. And um, that's the one where those toadfish came from. That's the one where that puffer fish came from. Uh, caught flounder there as well last year. Uh, and spot and little croaker and little rockfish. And I wanted to, to, to bring it up because... There are a lot of different artificial reefs in the Chesapeake. And if you get Wayne Young's, Young's book on, on the reefs, uh, you'll, you'll find them all. Uh, you can go to fishtalkmag.com and find his articles, which will link out to Amazon, to his books if you want to see them. Um, there, there are a ton of these reefs, and these reefs do hold fish. Now, the reason I specifically put this one up on the screen is because this is a reef ball reef, right? A lot of the reefs are made with bridge sections. And in my experience, if you bottom fish over the reefs with bridge sections adrift, you will quickly lose every rig in your tackle box. Don't drift these reefs, okay? You kind of got to anchor up on them. The reef ball reefs, you can get away with drifting. It's not quite as bad. You're still going to lose some stuff. Don't get me wrong. You, you got to accept that. That's part of the game fishing these reefs. You, you will lose tackle. Um, but you can at least get away with it on the reef ball reefs and some of these others, there, there are some different structures, tetrahedron, tetrahedrons and some other items that have been used through the years. Um, but you know, <laughs> where you've got those bridge sections and you'll see them on the meter, you'll see these, 
massive structures in the artificial reef areas. Don't try drift fishing over them with bottom rigs. They will quickly disappear. Um, and that, that reef in particular in the chop tank, that's a great one. And there are lots of them throughout the bay that are, that are really pretty awesome. All right, go ahead and take me to the next one here, Chris. So uh, this is not reef territory. What you're looking at here, go ahead and make it big again, block me out. What you're looking at here, if you look on the right side, you'll see uh, is Chris Field. So we're on the Tangier Sand now, right? And uh, these arrows are pointing again to edges, although the, the lowest arrow, uh, there, there is a kind of a plateau there that is really, really good at times. You catch a ton of fish there. All kinds of fish, croaker, spot, flounder, used to be sea trout. Uh, and those edges, uh, they go to pretty deep water. And the common tactic down there when you're bottom fishing is normally to try and find some fish on the meter and then anchor up. Um, that does work. It's not what I do on those edges. I tend to drift them unless there's a lot of wind or a lot of current. Uh, just because personally, I feel like when I'm bottom fishing, anchoring is a, is a big investment. It, it's dedicating me and all my fishing lines to that specific spot for a certain amount of time. Uh, it makes noise when I'm anchoring. It takes effort. It, it just kind of changes a lot of the dynamics of the way that I'm fishing. So personally, I prefer to be adrift. Uh, if you get down here and fish these edges, OMG, 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 put down some peeler crab and put down some soft crab because you have a really good shot at getting into some uh, drum, at getting into some weak fish if they come back. Um, the, 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 the variety of fish down here is just spectacular. Um, and, and I wanna mention, uh, the last couple of weeks, there's been a good bite in the Tangier on drum for guys fishing peeler crab. They've also been picking up some specks here and there, although more of the spec fishing has been lure oriented. Uh, but I wanted to bring this up because I got an email from someone today who said, are the reds still biting in the sound? Should I run down there? And my response was, good luck. You're going to have a hard time because guess what? The rays have showed up. Early this week, we started getting the reports on the rays. When the rays show up, uh, it gets really, really, really tough to fish with bait for a while. Uh, they just, you know, it seems like every cast you hook a ray and you end up just battling with rays all day long. That's going to be the story down there, particularly in the shallower areas where the big rats have been caught. Uh, that's going to be the story for, I don't know, at least a couple of weeks. Um, up here in the, in the, uh, working your way up the bay to the middle bay, um, it's going to start being a problem for the chummers. Hey, you know, for the time being, the chummers have been dealing with catfish after catfish after catfish. So it won't seem like a huge change. Uh, it's been tough to sort through them and get to the rockfish. Um, but the, you know, once the rays move in, it changes the dynamic. Now they'll do their thing. They'll scatter out. They'll disperse and won't be such a big deal anymore, but it's going to take a couple weeks for that to happen. All right, Chris, we got any questions at this point? Gosh, um, it's, I mean, I've got a, uh, yeah, I guess I do. <laughs> okay, couple more up there. What time we got? 5.34, so we, we keep going a bit. Does live lining small white perch work at this time of year? Heck, yes, it absolutely does. In fact, if you go up, say north of pools island where they don't see many spot you go to the lower susquehanna that's that's a pretty standard procedure up there guys live line with white perch all the time you don't have to do anything special some people say i'll oh, take scissors and cut off the dorsal trust me the rockfish are not scared to eat that fish with its spines uh they know what they're doing they eat them plenty often absolutely yes it totally does work uh Everyone wants to know what's good to eat. A ray is good to eat. Okay, so you'll find some people who will say rays are good to eat. Um, they often talk about soaking them in milk for like 24 hours first or soaking them in beer first. And then, I don't know, you do a rain dance and you throw paprika over your left shoulder and you throw a horseshoe over your right shoulder and it doesn't taste bad. I don't know. I've tried it. Um I have not killed a ray in many, 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 many years because I found it pretty dang awful. Um, feel free to try it for yourself. They're edible. You're not going to hurt anything. 
there's certainly no shortage in their population. In fact, if anything, they're overpopulated, uh, which I have been told has an impact on our soft clam population, which is a big bummer because soft clams are my very favorite food. You can't even get them half the time. Um, but I'm saying, no, they're not great to eat. Now, I should, I should back up a second and say that a uh, good friend of mine, um, Josh Lowry, who is uh, currently mating on a boat out of OC, he's, he's diehard into fishing. Um, when he lived at home, he lived next door to me. He was my, he's my next door neighbor's son. When he lived at home, he asked us, he asked everybody to please keep him to him or he would go out bell hunting for him. And the reason was because they're an excellent crabbing bait, which I never knew, but he swore by it uh, and he used them all the time. And uh, evidently, if you cut the wings up and put them in a, in a pull trap, they're an excellent crabbing bait. Hmm. Well, how do you get them off the hook? Oh, man. Uh, pliers, never bring them into the boat. Pliers over the side, jerk them off. Worst case scenario, you cut the line near the hook as close to, to it as you can. Um, Stan, uh, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I'm trying to remember. I don't think you ever told me about it, but I, I know guys who have found the bad part of the ray, the stinger, uh, and it is a horrific experience. It swells up. It's nasty. You'll end up going to the hospital. That's the bottom line. So if you want to – I have brought them into the boat once or twice to take pictures. Some people love to take the pictures. What I do is uh, I take the, uh, the, uh, a pair of dykes, right, real strong snippers. Can't, can't be wimpy snippers. Your little line clippers aren't going to do it. Uh, while they're still in the net, net and still contained, you put on leather gloves and clip off that stinger. doesn't hurt the animal, but you get rid of that stinger, and then it can't sink it in you, and you're, you're a whole lot safer. Then everyone can take their pictures, and then you can put it back over the side or, you know, as you please. <laughs> Throw back? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Um. I got to tell you, they, people were really interested in your location report because the questions just like stopped the second you went in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, is there a, here we go. One more question from James here. Is the length of the leader important when live lining? Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, I tend to like as long a leader as my rods will handle without making it hard, to, you know, without being necessary to high stick to get the fish up in the netting range. That's about three, four feet, four feet. Yeah. Um, you can use shorter. I don't think it's going to be a, you know, I don't think you'll have a tremendous handicap from it. Um, but what happens is, you know, uh, when I, when I'm live lining, uh, if I can, I go with no weight. Best thing in the world is to let the spot go where he wants to go. Cause he's going to try and go where the other fish are and the rock fish are going to find him on the way. Uh, but if you're in a high current, you need to add weight. Well, if you have a really short leader, that weight's going to stay close to that fish. Now, I haven't fished short leaders and longer leaders side by side to say, I, I don't like to surmise, I can't say that it's going to make a big difference in how many bites you get. Uh, I do know that in certain places with certain fish, very short leaders are considered normal. The North Carolina guys fishing the Pamlico Sound for big redfish, they fish a leader this long before the weight. And... They claim that it's not a problem, so maybe it isn't. I don't know, but um, yeah. What you know? One thing I want to add about the locations. You said a lot of people really tuned in on the locations. Um, one of the beautiful things about bottom fishing is anywhere there's oyster bar, you drift over the oyster bar with your bottom rigs. You won't get snagged, and you will catch fish. I mean, obviously, I can't guarantee you're going to catch fish every time you you know fish on an oyster bar, but generally speaking, oyster bars hold fish. And when you find a shell bottom in the upper bay, you're going to catch white perch, probably spot. When you find one in the middle bay, you're going to catch white perch. You're going to catch spot. Um, you don't know what else is going to pop up. Any of the species present in the lower bay could pop up. When you get down to the lower bay and you start dragging a bottom rig with a bloodworm over oyster bar, you're going to catch all kinds of stuff. You're going to catch little weak fish, little flounder. Um, you know, put out some bigger baits, maybe get some bigger ones, uh, just all kinds of stuff. The, the little sea bass, um, puffer fish, uh, sea robins, lizard fish, you know, uh, uh, rockfish, bluefish. It's just kind of an endless mix. So uh, if you're ever worried about like finding the right location of bottom fish uh, and you're not near any reefs, you don't know of any specific knolls or anything like that you want to hit, 
I just think oyster bar, oyster bar, oyster bar, oyster bar. North Bay by Pools Island, best location for spot perch. So uh, up by pools, there are some phenomenal lumps. Um, I'm talking it's 10 feet one minute and 20 feet the next minute. On top of those lumps will do well. Um, you'll want to uh, maybe try out Man of War Shoals. That's going a little farther south. Um, <clears throat> uh, Turkey Point, the drop-offs by Turkey Point are pretty phenomenal, although you're going to get a lot of catfish in the mix there. A lot of catfish in the mix too and fewer spot. Um, trying to think of other spots by pools. You know, when I was when I was younger and my dad had a bit of a bike and we would go there all the time. And th those lumps on the south side of pools where it goes 20 feet, 10 feet, 20 feet, 8 feet, those are those are phenomenal. I would go right, that's one of my first spots. And just to by the way, you should be able to live line your spot there and catch your rockfish. Uh, we used to do an awful lot of eeling there. Uh, and there'd be boats coming from all over, from Salmons to go eeling at Pools Island. I'm, I'm going back years and years ago, right after the moratorium opened. Um, there were there were 30 plus inch resident fish in the fall there. The, that bite kept up for three, four years. It was great. Uh, maybe a, a believer in the thought that perhaps we limit the size of our resident fish more by our fishing practices than anything else, because those are resident fish. It was fall. They were there. They were 35, 36 inches, some 38s. Um, and we know from the recent migratory study performed by Dave Secor and UMCES that uh, at 32 inches, the majority of the fish migrate out of the bay. And it doesn't matter if they're male or female. They hit 32 inches, they're like, oh, hey, I can cruise up to New York now. And they do. Or Massachusetts. I can, I can go up there for the summer. They do. Uh, but not all of them. There's a certain percentage that remain behind. And when that moratorium went out after years and years of nobody targeting rockfish throughout the season, we had an awful lot of resident fish that were well over 30 inches. Like I said, it took three, four years. They kind of disappeared. You know, you still rarely get one these days. But back then, I mean, I'm talking, you know, there'd be 50 boats and every one of them would catch their limit of fish of that size range. So I'm kind of going off on a tangent there. I apologize for that. Uh, any intel on sharp silent line black drum fishery thus far this season? Ma, the answer is no. I got none. Shame on me. I've almost always done an exploratory trip down there by this point in the year, and I have not made it happen. I'm making a note. I am going to be going. I'm going to be going down to the Stone Rock with some soft crab in the next. I'm going to say in the next five days. It's good to have golf. Ask me next weekend. Ask me next Thursday. I'll be able to tell you because that's a fishery that I love tapping into. Where else in the Middle Bay can you go and catch 60, 80 pound fish uh, uh, reliably? It's you know, it's a cool fishery. So I, I got to check that out. Um, and, and if you got any, shoot me an email. <laughs> uh, Is the toxin between Bennett and Salmon's goods? Good for spot and croaker. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would say that uh, it's great for spot and has been great for croaker in some past years. Um, you know, again, hopefully they'll come back in this year. Really hard to say. I mean, I, I don't want to go out. It's going out on a real ledge to, to make a prediction about that. Um, but, yes, absolutely. You've got real good territory there. That is real good bottom fishing territory. Best location for spot near the road river. So if you just go out to the mouth of the river where it meets the west, find some of those deeper drops. Um, if you want to go, uh, I know recently it's been good um, for a mix, more perch, but the spot are just starting up. This will this will kind of roll over and become more spot. Uh, inside the green number one, there's a, if you, if you look at where the green number one is at the mouth of the west and the south, and then you head west, you'll see a shelf where it comes up to 15 feet of water uh, rapidly. That's a real good shelf uh, historically. And there have been fish there already this year. So if you want to run out there, that's going to be a really good spot. Um, <clears throat> um, let's see, where else? Uh, inside the pound net at the mouth of the west there is often a good spot um, that, you know, 
I haven't tried a whole bunch myself, so I, I can't tell you any beyond that right now, but those are all good spots. They should all be productive right now. Uh, and here's something from uh, Rich, but it's really not a question. He just wants you to run for president. <laughs> I thought was nice. Oh my God! Come on, Rich, give me a break. And a, and a good way to segue and uh, thank everybody for joining us. Um, we didn't get to everybody's question, but I but uh, as always, um, I know you'll go back and check them out. Yes. And um, uh, and try and answer them as best you can. Uh, I'll, go, I'll go right from here to Facebook before I eat dinner, and I will answer everything I possibly can. And folks, feel free to post them later on. I'll go back and I'll try and keep track of them. But wait, Chris, yeah, isn't someone about to win a prize? They are. <laughs> I want to say congratulations to Dan Dunkers, who is the proud uh, recipient or will be of the Boat Life Fiberglass Powder Cleaner and Stain Remover. Um, Dan, I'm going to uh, instant message you and ask you kindly for your shipping address. and We'll get this into the mail for you ASAP. Nice. Uh, I want to thank everybody for all their questions and participating and, uh, and of course, just for tuning in. And uh, if you have any questions, please post them in here. We try and get back um, even to post show and, uh, and, and answer those. And uh, we had a great audience tonight, by the way. Um, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Next week, um, we'll post up. We'll do another live with Lenny, obviously, at, uh, at 5 o'clock on Thursday. Um, we'll let, let let you know the topic around Tuesday, Wednesday ish. Um, it will be something. Yeah, it'll be something. Can I, can I make a special request, Chris? Uh, sure. It's your show. Next week, can we give away a fishing lure? Sure, we can give away anything we want. Yeah, yeah I think we should give away a fishing lure next week. All right. Well, you supply, I give away. <laughs> 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 um, so anyway, um, folks, if you enjoyed this and uh, you like what you hear, you like what you see, um, please uh, sign up for our emails. Make sure you like us on Facebook, all that good stuff. And, and more importantly, share it with your friends. Say, hey, you guys got to check this out. Um, there's some good stuff going on. And if you're into fishing on the bay, um, please check out Fish Talk Ma Magazine uh, when, uh, when you get to your local bait and tackle shop. Or look us up online at fishtalkmag.com. And, and, and Chris, I don't want to interrupt you, but I just want to mention the June edition just hit the streets. Yes. Just I, I got a, I got a I got an email from someone today about one of the pictures in it. And I was like, whoa, it's out. Yay. I didn't even know it yet, but it's out. Yes. So really happy about that. And you know, we're on the street right now is that stores are opening up, businesses are opening. So uh, let's uh, obviously stay careful out there, still practice good measures, but um, uh, get out there and grab your copy of Fish Talk and tell all your friends about it. And until then, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Thanks, Lenny. Don't miss another cool Fish Talk video. Click below to subscribe.